Thank you for watching this video from the Center for European Studies at Carleton University. This event was organized by the Center for European Studies and Canada-Europe Transatlantic Dialogue and supported by Carleton University and by grants from the European Union and Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. The views expressed in this video are solely those of the presenter and do not reflect the views of the European Union, Center for European Studies, and Carleton University. Good afternoon, everyone. It, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, as, as you've been forewarned by Matt Hoffman, I'm, I'm going to be the anti-Pollyanna. Uh, but I do want to celebrate the leadership that has happened at the subnational level in Canada. Um, where we differ, I think, is in the degree of optimism about those um, innovations spreading to other provinces and on to the national level, particularly in the Canadian context. Um, We've already noted that the federal government has been doing very little for 25 years in, in Canada, and that has created a vacuum that has been partially been filled by the provinces. And I'll uh, just say a bit about uh, three particular leaders. The province of Quebec has set an ambitious target to reduce its emissions to 20 percent below 1990 levels by 2020. Uh, they have entered into a cap and trade program with California, and I think the most exciting um, innovation of that new program is that in January of this year they extended uh, the cap-and-trade program to transportation and household emissions at the point of fuel distribution. I believe they're the first um, cap-and-trade program to extend to um, those small point sources. The uh, province of Ontario, 15% uh, below 1990 by 2020, and has done a number of things as well, um, promoting renewable uh, electricity, a shift from coal to renewables with a feed-in tariff, um, a decision to completely phase out coal-fired coal power plants, were, which were a significant source of electricity in the province, and an announcement earlier this year that Ontario would join the cap-and-trade program with Quebec and California, though um, the details of that are, are um, being worked, worked on feverishly now, and we will hear more soon. And the final province I would identify as a leader within um, the Canadian Federation is British Columbia, um, a particularly ambitious target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 33 percent below 2007 levels by 2020. Less ambitious than uh, relative to 1990 because, in fact, BC saw significant emissions growth from 1990 to 2007. A clean electricity standard at 100 percent because BC is fortunate to have mountains and rushing rivers and potential to create hydroelectricity and already was very close to um, 100 percent, but new coal plants were proposed at the time of that standard. Adoption of a low carbon fuel standard, although BC's, unlike the one in California, does not differentiate between tar sands and conventional fuel. Interesting um, difference. And I think most notably the adoption of a revenue neutral carbon tax in 2008, which covers um, industrial uh, transportation and household emissions. I think there are a number of reasons why one can be enthusiastic about leadership at the subnational level or the national level um, when we look to the international context. The first is one we've noted, which is um, these actors are coming up with new ways of doing things and there can be learning across jurisdictions. Um, I wouldn't say that what we've seen among Canadian provinces is truly novel, but they are early adopters on some of these um, policies and at adapting them, creating potential for um, furthering lesson drawing across jurisdictions. Um, a lot of important research, much of it done by Nick Rivers here in the second row, on um, documenting that the BC carbon tax is working, uh, the Ontario feed-in tariff, low carbon fuel standards. A second and rather different mechanism by which um, leadership can spread to other jurisdictions is by providing reassurance that there will not be a loss of jobs. We often talk about a race to the bottom, the idea that um, jurisdictions, whether subnationally or nationally, will be reluctant to regulate pollution of any sort unilaterally because they're concerned that um, they will, the jobs will just leak out to another jurisdiction. 
they won't achieve the environmental objective, and at the same time, um, they will pay an economic price. I think that we tend to exaggerate that threat by analyzing it in terms of a prisoner's dilemma when more often we're in uh, what's called an assurance or stag hunt game, one where jurisdictions are concerned about losing jobs, but their preferred, preferred option is for everybody to regulate and everybody to keep, keep their industries. And in that context, having one jurisdiction step up and say, we're going to do it can be tremendously important in moving the other jurisdictions that are not seeking to undercut them, but merely looking for that reassurance, providing them with reassurance that they can regulate as well. A third mechanism is that rather than just leaving it up to the jurisdictions to act um, on their own, they can get together and provide even stronger reassurance by linking arms and saying, we're going to do this together. And Matt Hoffman has already alluded to the number of initiatives that have been emerging. Uh, Reggie in the US, Northeast, and Mid-Atlantic states, the Western Climate Initiative, now largely defunct and been replaced by Quebec and, Ontar Quebec and California with the promise of Ontario joining an emerging Pacific Coast Action Plan, California, Oregon, BC, and Washington. And finally, even those who are um, tremendously enthusiastic about subnational climate activism are often um, don't assume that it can be left to the states or provinces forevermore, the idea being that once a few of them have acted, it makes it easier for the national government to set, um, either preempt or set baseline standards. So wh what's the evidence? Um, and these are three reasons I want to mention why I'm less optimistic. I couldn't bring myself to say pessimistic. So I, I have a little Pollyanna in me as well. Um, and I'll say a bit more about each of these. The first is that we've got leaders, but not everybody is following. The second is that there are limits to provincial collaboration, particularly in, um, in a context where there's an expectation of consensus um, to move forward. And finally, in the Canadian uh, Federation, a massive failure of leadership. Uh, James Meadowcroft indicated that you know, because we're a big country with diverse resource endowments, we have, in essence, 10 little countries, each of which is quite different. And this figure is trying to illustrate just how great those differences are. This is the per capita greenhouse gas, annual greenhouse gas emissions in different Canadian provinces. And they span from about 10 to 65. Tends kind of a lot like a Western European country, probably comparable to France, a little bigger than Sweden. Um, Saskatchewan and Alberta have per capita greenhouse gas emissions that are higher than any of the OPEC oil producing states. So it's not just that um, they're kind of different. Those differences create very different political incentives. And for the same reason, we wouldn't expect Sweden and Qatar to automatically get along and link arms and act together. We haven't had a whole lot of luck with that so far in Canadian climate change policy. Um, what I want to do, how long have I been going? Uh, eight minutes. Very quickly, um, <laughs> is uh, give a quick overview uh, a little bit deeper in four of those provinces. Uh, Quebec, endowed with abundant hydroelectric power, and also the development of that power is very much um, integral to Quebec nationalism, a sense of identity. Uh, Quebec is also the province where public opinion is most strongly in favor of action on climate change. Um, I do find it a bit interesting that Quebec, despite that, has gone as far as they have because as a province that already has relatively low per capita emissions, the next reductions are going to be relatively costly. They have to go after the transportation. I think there's a, a couple possibilities to explain that. One is that as initiatives spread, there's potential for more hydro exports to other jurisdictions. The other is, I think, that um, Quebec is entirely reliant on imported oil. If they can substitute um, energy from local sources, electricity for that oil, um, that has uh, trade advantages. And as I mentioned, we've seen fairly aggressive, uh, fairly aggressive policies um, from the province of Quebec. They'd fit nicely, I think, in the European Union. Um, 
The locals will know which province is coming up next. It is Ontario. Um, Ontario also has abundant hydro, but has also relied on both nuclear and historically coal. And um, this is a picture of a coal plant being uh, demolished. And if you ever want to feel a little bit of optimism, there's a video, it's about two minutes, of coal plants being blown up. Um, and I have occasionally turned to that video in my darker moments. Um, but there were other things going on in the Ontario cont uh, context, really serious concerns um, that were salient to the electorate about uh, urban air quality. Addressing the coal-fired power plants was a significant part of that, and also an opportunity to create local jobs with um, renewable energy. So the phase out of coal, promoting the local renewables to replace that coal-fired electricity, and emissions trading still to come. Alberta. Um, endowed with abundant fossil fuels and has built an economy that relies on those fossil fuels. Using coal as a source of electricity for um, almost all of the electricity in the province and a very export-oriented oil and gas industry. So a lot of the emissions in Alberta are coal, coal combustion for electricity, but a lot of them are making, producing oil that will be burned somewhere else. And the province continues to have as core goals um, expanding the export of its um, increasingly unconventional oil, uh, diversifying markets, uh, especially towards Asia, um, a long history of trying to defend Alberta's ownership of that oil. The provincial government owns the oil, so defending it from federal intervention. And Alberta is the one province in Canada where, as of 2013, fewer than 50% believed that climate change was caused by human activity. Um, so we have seen um, more uh, light than heat, heat than light, um, policies that have sounded good, but when you look more closely, are nowhere near um, as strong. So intensity-based targets that have allowed emissions and have been predicated on assumption that production would continue to expand and emissions with it. Um, just yesterday, the new NDP premier of, of, um, of Alberta gave a speech in which she is widely quoted as saying there is no, no long-term future uh, for the oil sands in Alberta's economy, but she gave the province 100 years. <laughs> so when she said long term, she's still thinking pretty long term. Um, but Andrew Leach is leading uh, an exercise to advise the new provincial government, and I think we will see um, a redirection of policy towards greater stringency, but Alberta is not going to become Quebec. And finally, my own province, which is, I think, the most schizophrenic of the Canadian provinces. Um, again, uh, richly endowed with hydroelectric potential, which uh, we've taken advantage of. BC's number one export in most of the last 10 years has been coal. We just don't burn it ourselves. Um, there is a tremendous, and that's relatively low um, extraction emissions. What's going to be more problematic is a push for expansion of unconventional gas production for export in the form of LNG, which we've got this great carbon tax, but has the potential to dramatically increase British Columbia's emissions. So we see that inconsistency. Um, a push for greenhouse gas reductions, an ambitious target, uh, a carbon tax, and at the same time, approving new coal ports and um, calling for expansion of LNG. Um, a couple other points I want to make about the differences in provinces that they're growing, not getting smaller. So these are the change in total greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 to 2012. We've got a bunch of provinces that have experienced stable or declining emissions and three that happen to be fossil fuel exporters that have seen quite dramatic growth in emissions and are planning to continue the expansion of their fossil fuels. The leaders are the greenest of the provinces, and that is true as well among U.S. states. We have seen that the, the subnational jurisdictions that are taking action tend to have the least greenhouse gas intensive economies. They have had often other reasons to do it, which is a good thing, except that not everybody shares those reasons. So at those with the worst air quality have been most aggressive. Those that have potential 
to create local jobs by reducing reliance on imports have been stronger at acting. But for everyone who's in that position, there's another jurisdiction that is selling them the dirty stuff. So I think we've had a case where we've got strong leadership, but much weaker followership. followership. And in fact, we've got jurisdictions that are simply resisting following the leaders. So that's the first mechanism. The second, the other ones are quicker, though. <laughs> um, the, the second is provincial collaboration. You can find all kinds of pictures on the internet of governors and, and premiers shaking hands and pose, posing for photo opportunities. Um, but again, the problem is that um, not everybody wants to collaborate. Alberta expressly did not join the Western Climate Initiative. They chose to play their own, their own game. Um, many of the jurisdictions that did join the Western Climate Initiative withdrew when it became clear that there would be no immediate um, move to a national cap-and-trade program in either the U.S. or Canada. All U.S. states but California withdrew, and the whole Midwest initiative fell apart. Reggie has survived. Turning to the Canadian provinces and the Council of the Federation, we have had a multi-year effort to develop the Canadian energy strategy. This summer, there was an important document or a big announcement. I wouldn't say it was an important document because it revealed the fundamental challenge of collaboration among Canadian provinces where there is an expectation of consensus. And that has led to the lowest common denominator. So there's lots of lovely language in that document, but remarkably few specifics. And the kinds of commitments they make are to do things like study the issue. Um, the differences between these provinces are not going to be papered over by using the word energy instead of oil and, oil and gas or infrastructure instead of pipelines. What about the feds? Um, as with the provinces, there is a very strong norm of federal-provincial consensus in Canadian politics. Um, all the provinces are defensive of their natural resources, so every one of them, even those that were in favor of the Kyoto Protocol, signed a document objecting to the federal government's unilateral adoption of a Kyoto implementation plan. At one point, nine provinces had called for a national cap-and-trade program. The one that opposed it was Alberta. We didn't get one. Nine provinces had called for tighter auto tailpipe standards. The one that opposed it was Ontario. We didn't get one. Um, a special factor in the Canadian context is Quebec nationalism, where we've got this case where the greenest of the provinces, the one that is most aggressive, is also the most resistant to um, national standards. Um, the other problem we've got is uh, federal politicians, the parties, want to um, win elections in the same jurisdictions that are most opposed. Um, and we've ended up with this very surreal current election debate where we've got politicians talking about their commitment to development of the, um, the, the tar sands and at the same time promising extremely ambitious greenhouse gas reduction targets that are completely incompatible with that. Um, the Conservatives have said we're having national regulations but not for oil. The Liberals have promised to leave it to the provinces, but we'll have some sort of national program with a Medicare approach. I, I mean, I, I, I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> the NDP has come closest, I think, to promising something truly national by saying they would develop a national cap and trade program with an opportunity for opt out under, um, under specific conditions still to come. I think the next steps, and this is my last slide, because I've got a zero there, um, are, depending what happens on October 19th, um, if there is a minority liberal or NDP government or a uh, coalition, we're going to start seeing a lot more negotiation between the federal government and the provinces. And I think a really critical thing is going to be whether we have a federal government that's willing to broach conflict, is willing to move beyond the lowest common denominator of consensus. The other alternative is that we can continue along our current path and let our trading partners take care of this problem for us. And what this bottom figure shows, it's uh, drawn from a publication by McLeod and Eakins that came out in Nature in 2015. It's unfortunately probably too small, but what they show is what percent of fossil fuel reserves are burnable in each country 
under a 2C scenario. The unconventional oil column says 99 and 100% all the way down. If our trading partners get serious about climate change, our oil is going to be the first to go. And that will reduce Canada's emissions, but also be extremely painful for the Canadian economy. Thank you.